chairs, there is a little defect that tells us more about what we do uh, and the upcoming events. Uh, but we probably have one tomorrow about the philosophy of upcycling, another very interesting topic. But we also have courses, physical courses, uh, which one starts on the 5th, no, sorry, 6th of February, and the first evening, as it says, is free. So I want you to come and see what it is all about. <coughs> um, you can also Search our, um, our program on, on the internet, on our website, in www.uk.org. Uh, and you can also follow us on, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Meetup. There's a few of you uh, for today. Uh, there's also another paper here, which is, uh, if, you can, if you are willing to put your email address, uh, you, we will send you then uh, through our mailing list the upcoming events, and you also have access to our um, magazine, which is for free, uh, every October two months. Um, if you have questions after the talk, there will be time. And uh, if you have tea and coffees, and you can have a talk with the, uh, with the speaker tonight. So I'm pleased to introduce you our speaker on the artificial intelligence. Um, this is Dr. Catarina Moreira. Uh, she has a PhD in uh, information system. <laughs> and she'll tell you a bit more about it. And she's a professor now at uh, the Leicester University, but not for long. So we're very lucky because she's flying to Australia next week. Um, and she will tell you more now tonight about artificial intelligence, the myth of reality, and all that it entails. So please, a warm welcome to our speaker tonight. <laughs> nowadays, we live with it, but usually many people don't understand what artificial intelligence means. And it usually comes because people usually associate it to science fiction, so artificial intelligence beings that have the same intelligence as we humans, maybe beings or beings made out of matter that have an intelligence superior to, other, to, to ourselves. So is it really this? Or um, is it something a little bit more simple? So, what I wanted to do with this, what I want to do with this talk is precisely to understand what is artificial intelligence. I promise I will not touch a single mathematical equation, but I promise you that every every single person in this room will leave that door knowing what machine learning actually means and what it means for a machine to actually learn. So, let's start. So, how did it start artificial intelligence? So, it started with a gathering. So, we have here four people that changed the course of our lives. In uh, 1956, if I'm not mistaken, John McCarthy gathered a set of people to try to discuss how can automatons show cognitive futures such as humans. And they were trying to come up with a way to say, how should we coin this? Because John McCarthy, McCarthy was a mathematician. There are other people who are engineers, or other types, many professions. And none of them were agreeing on a term. Because for John McCarthy, McCarthy, for instance, he didn't like the word automaton, because for him, as a mathematician, means something else. So they gathered together, and they coined the new field artificial intelligence. Maybe 
it was this word that actually associated such spooky things associated to it. Maybe it was just a bad choice of name. But artificial intelligence is nothing more, or initially, as thought by John McCarthy in the Dartmouth uh, Conference, nothing more as to simulate each of the different faculties of intelligence using machines. And these different faculties can be, for instance, learning, reasoning, memory. We can see nowadays some work about creativity, machines that try to make art, but that's a little bit, of, again, a subjective topic because we cannot really define the general concept of art. What is art for me cannot be art for other people. So we'll leave this one a little bit aside and perception. So, and the thing that I want to tell is maybe this principle is a little bit older than we think. If we erase the name machines and put, for instance, try to simulate these different faculties of intelligence in things using matter, we see back in Judaism, it's the first, uh, no, uh, uh, the first being coming out of matter presenting human features. And this being was called Golem, which uh, appears in the Bible once, and it means raw material. So it's like the unfinished work of God. So it was, Golem was made out of clay, and he had many of human features. In Christianism, we have Adam that was also made out of clay and has even more humanistic features than we, uh, that we think. And we also have Pinocchio. <laughs> so Pinocchio is also made of wood, and he also shows human and cognitive functions. So this concept of trying to put matter to have our functions as humans is way <coughs> older than that conference that was created by McCarthy. <laughs> so nowadays we can define artificial intelligence as the study of intelligent agents that can perceive their environment and perform different actions to solve tasks that involve mimicking cognitive functions of humans. See, that's artificial intelligence. <laughs> so what does this mean? When we basically say, for instance, I have colleague, colleagues at the business school in Leicester saying, I'm using artificial intelligence in finance. And I look and I say, well, artificial intelligence can is a broad field of research. It can either involve planning, develop programs that, specific, that, are, that are trained to do planning, systems that are based or they are going to do cognitive systems knowledge representation, perception. Robots need to have perception of their environment. Natural language process processing to make automatic translation of text. Machine learning, we will see what this is. Robotics, so what exactly a person means by I'm using artificial intelligence in finance. This is as broad as saying I'm using financial management in my company. <laughs> I mean, that's why we need to understand first what it means before we try to apply these concepts just to sound that professional. Okay. So I speak about, so the goal of artificial intelligence is to use algorithms to mimic cognitive functions. What are algorithms? Many people speak about algorithms. They say they are, they are the devil of nowadays. So let's try to understand what algorithms mean. Well, an algorithm, you can see it as a recipe. When you make a cake, you follow an algorithm. You follow a, step, a set of steps or a set of rules that will allow you to solve the problem of making cake. So, and uh, for instance, the summation of two numbers, which is something that we all learn how to do it when we are very, very young, is also an algorithm. So, if we want to sum two numbers, I, I say that, okay, three plus uh, seven gives 10, so 10, and I carry one number. I sum these two numbers with a carry, and I have my final answer. So <coughs> the summation of two numbers is nothing more than an algorithm as well. So again, an algorithm is nothing more than a set of rules, nothing more. So how can these sets of rules 
help in the definition of the artificial intelligence? Well, we can create robots, so artificial intelligence, this broad field, we can use algorithms to make robots to clean our floor. So these Roomba uh, robots, they are focused on planning, on search algorithms and on perception. So they need to identify corners in the room, they need to identify if there's dirt on the floor, then they vacuum. We have, for instance, neural networks and machine learning that are used, for instance, in self-driving cars that we hear so much about Tesla company, for instance. Or we even have Siri, which uses natural language processing, so Siri is capable to recognize our voice, to pass a map it into text, and to try to come up with an answer. So we call these systems question answering systems. And of course, Siri also uses machine learning um, to improve uh, its answers. But as you can see, Siri is not that intelligent at all. If you try to play around with Siri, you don't get the, that much, um, not, not really interesting questions. It's already some rules that are pre-programmed, like get the content, something like that. So artificial intelligence, this broad field that incorporates a very important topic that nowadays it's the root of many discussions machine learning. And now deep learning. If you speak about deep learning to an European grant, they're like, oh my god, this is a breakthrough. No, deep learning is nothing more than machine learning. You just add more layers of training. That's it. Okay? Nothing, nothing special. So, first myth. The first, uh, so we have IBM's, uh, IBM's Deep Blue, the first computer or the first machine to beat the human being. And to many people, when they saw this match, they said that the machine had intelligence. It was superior to the human being. Is it? So let's see what is uh, Deep Blue made of. So, Gary Kasparov is probably the youngest uh, world uh, champion in chess. With just 22 years old, he became the world champion in chess. And yet, he is only remembered by being the first man who lost against the machine. And the machine who, uh, who beat Gary Kasparov in an official tournament, so the first machine to win a chess match, the first machine to win an official tournament was IBM's Deep Blue. And IBM's Deep Blue does not use machine learning at all. No learning mechanisms are used, and we will see a little bit further what does learning really mean for a machine. But I can only t tell you that Deep Blue, what it did, was very equivalent to a brute force search. Many people even wanted to, ref uh, many people even refused to call Deep Blue artificial intelligence. Because what Deep Blue did was basically given a set of the board, the chess board, he basically mapped or laid down all the possible combinations that could be arrived from. So if I move the horse to the left, to the right, to the so all possible combinations. And the goal and the, the only thing that Deep Blue did more is that he used an algorithm that would help us prune <coughs> our our search process. So instead of dealing with one million states. The algorithm was able to already cut some paths that would not have, were not advantages to search. So instead of dealing with one million, maybe nine hundred thousand. Okay, this was the only difference. No, no machine learning, nothing. Just a machine that has more memory than humans. True, and is able to get, to process more information than humans. That's it. And actually, Kasparov won the first match against Deep Blue in 1995, 96. So, Kasparov, won, in a set of six games, Kasparov won four out of four out of those six games. And then IBM decided to improve this algorithm of the the, the searching. So it's called the alphabet the searching, just for curiosity. And uh, as you can see. They were not that far away, okay? They, so when it's 0.5, it means that there was a draw and they agreed on a draw. So there is only one match that separated them. Okay? So even this 
this um, is not very representative. And uh, according to, to reports, Kasparov even asked a rematch, but uh, IBM decided to dismantle the computer, and that's it. So, well, God knows why. <laughs> so, first myth. After all, what people tell us about that machine, that was the first example of a machine beating a human. People thought, my God, that is a sign that machines have intelligence. No, they have memory. They have more processing power. Of course, they can see more or process more information than we can. That's the only advantage. Back then, let's see what happened next. So, nowadays we have uh, these stories of uh, Isaac Asimov, of iRobot with uh, movies with Will Smith that he tries to battle uh, uh, a group of uh, robots that simply got self-aware and decided to destroy the planet and enslave humans. And, hmm, is it really a possibility with the technology that we have or for the understanding that we have about the field? So let's see if uh, machines are able to dominate the world. If this machine allows me to dominate. <laughs> okay. So we, you, we often hear that machines use neural networks, billions of them. I've heard this one. To simulate human cognitive processes. And because they use neural networks, they are, able, they are more intelligent than humans, and therefore, since they are super intelligent, they have the ability to dominate us, like we dominate other animals. Okay, what does it actually mean for a computer to be intelligent? So, when I put an X-ray to the, so when I see an X-ray, I see color, I see shapes, I see texture. The machine sees a bunch of pixels. This is what the machine has. This is the information of the perception of the machine of that image. <coughs> See, they're, they're really intelligent. See, you don't need to use that. <laughs> okay. So, what does machine learning really mean? So. We do the following, even for us humans, if we want to learn something, people give us examples of what chest is. And we try to see similar features. Okay, a chest has here two dark things that we know that are the lungs. Maybe a child does not perceive that. But they probably find patterns. Okay, there's here the, something that is separating two, two darker places, and they all have more or less the same shape. And if I do not see something that is not a chest, I see something completely different. And this is exactly what I give to the machine. So the machine will, if I represent an image, if I represent this chest, as for instance, I extract the shape of the object <coughs> and the color of the object. So this is a very simplistic scenario. But let's imagine that I represent a chest as a point that represents a shape and a color. And I see that everything that has a chest shares some patterns, so they are similar to each other in the space. Everything that is not chest is far away from it. So the goal of machine learning is precisely to find a way to separate these two classes of objects. So it starts like this, it sees, okay, this is, was not a good choice. This is also not a good choice. Mm, better, but still not good. But this one seems to be okay because everything on the left side of this line can be seen as a chest. And everything on the, the left, side, <laughs> left side of the line can be seen as not chest. Okay? So this is exactly what machine learning is. And there's nothing more than this is separating finding patterns in data and trying to come up with a function, this, in this case the function is simply a line, that is able to separate a category which is chest from a category which is not chest. And what it means is that 
This is only achieved by mini minimizing an error function. So it basically will compare each point and see how far away it is from that. And this is nothing more than machine learning. All this, so if I have a chest example, the machine saw this chest example, and I present the machine a new image that the machine has never seen before, the machine will ask, okay, are these points similar to each other? And no, they are not, so I will have a high error. If I will have a high error, it means that it's not a chest. On the other hand, if I show a chest example, and I present a new image that the machine has never seen before, the machine will detect that there are patterns. There are lots of similarities. So the error will say it's low. If it's a low error, then it means that I found a chest. So this is the core of machine learning, either minimizing an error function or maximizing a probability of something occurring. So how can something like this provide super intelligence? They just recognize patterns. So, and this can actually be quite useful for medicine, for us. Not as a way of super intelligence to dominate the world, but actually to help doctors to try to come up, try to understand if a person has a disease or not. So if I give several examples of the infiltration, the machine will be able to detect this better than a human. If I give the examples of pneumonia, the machine again will be better to see this better than a, a human because it has endless processing power and, and memory and storage. And actually this has, a, and the reality is that actually these things, these technologies are already being applied in hospitals. So we have the IBM Watson help, help that is already incorporating or helping doctors to come up with diagnosis for uh, patients. So again, is this, is machine learning a sign of super intelligence? No, it's just pure pattern recognition, nothing more. It's just a mathematical function, nothing more than that. And if people speak about neural networks, they are like the brain and therefore if they are like the brain, it means that somehow some consciousness will emerge and they will become like humans. Well, what's a neural network? That's Okay, so we have the biological neurons, so we see that the neurons are nothing more than a communicate via the synapses through chemical, electrical and chemical reactions. So biological neurons, they basically receive information from the dendrites, they process it, and then they transport this information throughout <coughs> the, the axon until the terminals. And they do this, and they also, while processing the information, if, this, if the neuron, which is, for instance, a neuron specific to activate a muscle in the arm, if this information is something that would activate this, then the neuron fires. So it's like an active a function that will activate the, the neuron, either it fires or not, according to its perceptions, to its in sensory input. And people try to come up with a mathematical representation of this, or a graphical representation of this. So this is usually what you see when we speak about neural networks. The dendrites are nothing more than the inputs, what will receive the sensory uh, input. The outputs is basically what's going to tell me chest or not chest. And then we have here a hidden layer which will apply that activation function that which will say if the fire if the neuron will fire or not <coughs> if the neuron will say that it's a chest or not a chest right? so again given an image as input this image will go through the neuron and the neuron will output this is an example of chest or not an example of chest so again neural networks is exactly the same principle that I've shown you before but simply with a different graphical representation. But again, the idea is always to find patterns in data, nothing more. Nothing more can emerge from this structure. And the cool thing is that you can also, this activation function in neurons is quite powerful because you can put a non-linear function, so a, something that is not a line, you can put a curve to separate your data. 
which is very helpful because sometimes the data cannot be such beautifully distributed as it is here. Sometimes it's more messy and you will need curves to separate the data. Okay? So again, it's all about minimizing an error. This is machine learning, this is neural networks, minimizing an error function. Okay? So we see the neural networks being applied in, for instance, <coughs> self-driving cars, as you can see. So we have the sensory input, which is the image, where we extract shapes. So we try to see that this is an object. We don't need to see that actually it's a human. Maybe it's processes also as a human, but only they need to know is it's an obstacle, so I should be aware. So it uh, segments the colors as well, the depth. So all of this information is given to the neural network, and the neural network will try it while driving. OK, I see a human, I stop. OK, I see a curve, I curve. OK, I see a straight road, I go forward. Nothing else. What else can we, can we do with uh, neural networks? Identify the sequence, the human genome. This is something that is a really big achievement because it's very, very hard, even for us humans, to identify patterns in such billions or millions um, pattern or um, chains of amino acids. So as you can see, the, as you know, the human genome is composed of uh, four amino acids, and these amino acids simply repeat themselves in combinations millions of times. And many times in, encoded in, these, in this genome is, for instance, a genetic disease. So computers can actually help us to try to understand better the genes that we carry, if we have a probability to have a disease or not. And again, it's all about finding patterns. Not superior intelligence. And again, the most recent uh, accomplishment was that a machine was, uh, was able to beat the best human in, a, in the game, which is Go. I don't know if you, you know this game. It's something that John Nash really loved. So people, this game is even harder to solve or to simulate in a computer than chess, because it's not just one piece that can move, because you, you are affecting several of them. Even the strategy matters, everything matters. In this case, AlphaGo used machine learning. So AlphaGo was able to see many, many plays of Go and was able to identify strategies that, uh, or come up with strategies that no human would be expecting to, to see in a game. And it was that component of surprise that uh, made the, the human lose the game. And of course, this can also be used for very interesting things. So now in Japan, people are using, uh, researchers are using uh, people that are paralyzed, that are in <coughs> hospitals paralyzed, they cannot move. They were able to extract the signals from their brains and use those signals to control robots. So they are paralyzed but they are actually contributing to society because they are working in a cafe by controlling robots to serve clients. Of course, this also has some questions that, uh, well, one can also, well, they cannot move, maybe we can, we can make them not speak and then we can do whatever out of them. So this also has some questions, but actually it's a very interesting phenomena that we are seeing. It's how can you make people that are paralyzed actually do something? That's really amazing. They, they're controlling robots uh, just with the brain signals. Amazing. So what is the verdict? After we saw what machine learning is, are we still with that idea that machines can dominate us? Well, we need when we when we start to use terms, it's always important that we try to understand what they mean. So intelligence, what, is, what does it mean to be intelligent? Even if I ask between us, what, what is intelligence? It's uh, the ability to understand, we would say. That would be something more close. But if we go to the roots of the word intelligence, so intelligence comes from intelligere, which basically means to read in between, to grasp, to get some discernment. So it's something 
It's something more deep that the machine cannot actually achieve as the way we are modeling nowadays. It's, it's impossible. How can the minimization of a, an error function show any signs of intelligence? It's a very interesting thing to, to think about. It. Myth versus reality. Well, no, I do not expect that robots will be self-aware and uh, dominate us, but I expect the usage, or actually it's already been used, of these technologies in military, replacing humans by machines. We already see it by drones. We already see it here by these tanks that, as you can see, they have cameras to have a <coughs> sensory perception of the environment. They can try to then detect if something is an enemy or a friend. So, and then in the end, if uh, there is a war where we try to reduce the number of humans and we just put machines, the country with the best technological advances wins. The country with most money wins. This is probably the, the reality that we should be more concerned, not that one. True consequences. Yes, jobs will be taken. Yes, jobs are being already taken by machines. And uh, it's up to governments nowadays to try to invest in new technologies. Yes, it's true that jobs will disappear, but new more jobs will be created. More people will be needed in this area of technology, so governments need to be aware that this is something that is already happening and need to invest more <coughs> in education or the, on the technological education of its citizens. Because doing routine tasks, like for instance this guy here on Amazon, packing stuff, a machine can do it. Everything that is a routine, everything that is able to get a pattern, a machine will do it. And the machine will not be tired, and a machine will have endless energy, and they will do it better than us. So we need to accept it and not deny it, because it's already happening around us. So, happening all around the world, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I put here one from Portugal, my country, so it says here that uh, until, uh, until 2030, 1.1 million of jobs will disappear in Portugal, and they, they will be taken by machines. So it's a, a, serious, a serious problem that should be considered. What are the real dangers in my opinion? So now we understand what artificial <coughs> intelligence is. We understand what machine learning is. So machine learning doesn't seem to be that dangerous. Okay, we can use it for military. Well, everything unfortunately is used for military. So what are the real dangers? Well, in my opinion, information and biotechnology are the two main concerns that we should have nowadays. So what is information technology? It's basically the concept that computers can store, can transmit, can receive and manipulate data and information. And they use this information to feed on businesses and enterprises to then use it for us, for us consumers, to buy more. Okay? So, and we, here, this time about big data, well, big data is also connected to this. Big data is nothing more than the ability that we have to store massive amounts of information, to process it, and to take value out of it. Take value is to take relevant information that can be useful for my company, for the products that I develop on my company. For instance, Kindle. When we have Kindle in our hands, Kindle knows how much time we spend on each page. Kindle knows if we finished reading the book. Kindle knows if we quit reading a book, we didn't like it. Kindle knows if we, I think it also allows me to highlight stuff, if I'm not mistaken. So it can see the topics related to the book. It can feed all this information to those machine learning algorithms that we saw before and try to come up with my user preferences. And then it passes to Amazon and it says this user likes this, that, and that. In the end, these algorithms start knowing us more than ourselves. And of course, the, since they are based on artificial intelligence, well, 
they will know it. They already know it, actually, and I will show you why. And the most interesting thing is that humans are losing their ability to think because we trust technology. If I'm in the middle of the road, I don't think where I should go. Google, tell me where to go. And Google tells me. If I'm in a traffic, if I'm in the road and I feel like I should go to the left, Google, Google says go to the right. And I say, Google doesn't know anything. The left is the one. And then I turn left, damn it, there's a traffic jam. Google knew it. And next time I'm in the same situation, I don't trust Google because my intuition did not work. And this is, comes from my personal cell phone. <coughs> Machines never forget. I live in Leicester, so in here you cannot see very well the picture, but it basically says what I've learned in the 6th of January. I've been in my house, I went to the university, I went to my friend's house, and I came back. It's 6th of January, it's still there. I went to Portugal to take care of my ID. <laughs> I arrived in the airport, from the airport, I went to the place where I take the ID, or this is the airport, and then I went to the place of January. I went back to my mother's house, and I said, I don't want to be in the house, I'm going to listen. It's here. And look here, even the photos that I took, the sunrise of Lisbon, I didn't share this with anyone. I didn't put this in any social network. I didn't send it to any of my friends, but it's in my phone. Google got the pictures that I took because every picture has a, a GPS coordinate associated to it. And Google knows that I was in Cais do Estudante. Google knows that I took, that I walked in one mile and I took this picture. Google knows that I went to a cafe called Madalena to get a pastry. <laughs> and then I went to the citizen uh, to get my citizen card uh, fixed. And then I went back to Cascais, which is where my parents live. This was 14th of January. My entire day in the 14th of January, still there. Oh, and I didn't finish. I went to Cascais, and it said exactly where my house is. <laughs> which is because I was reading a book in my house. I took a picture because, oh, I want to take note of this thing that I'm reading. It's here a picture. <laughs> so you can even try this yourselves. You go to Google Maps, you go, you go to the more options, and you will see timeline. In timeline, a calendar appears, you just choose a day. All your routine is there. Amazing. Amazing what Google knows about ourselves. This is actually what we should be concerned. <laughs> China. China is using a credit system to punish or reward citizens. If the citizens do not do good deeds, then points are taken away from citizens. And the low score citizens, and the low score, so they start with 20,000 points. If you are already 900, then can already stop you for getting a train ticket. And distances in China are crazy. So going by bus, it's the ultimate punishment. <laughs> <laughs> it can forbid you to go to good jobs, to apply for good jobs. Can for, uh, forbid you to put kids in good schools. This is already happening in some places in China. But for still our relief, this is being done manually. So a person goes with a notebook. What have you done today? I heard this about uh, Maria did what? So you write down everything. And the worst thing is you put this information public to everyone to see. So people feel the urge to display that I'm a good person. How can you be good in a place that does not allow you to be bad? It's an interesting question that one should ask. What China is moving now is to automate this system. They want to use machine learning to find patterns in our faces to identify who we are. I don't know if you saw in Facebook that 10-year uh, uh, challenge. So there was the 10-year challenge where you put a picture of you 10 years ago picture of you today. Oh, the data that you got, the data you got for, that. <laughs> for facial recognition, really. You fed the system with massive amounts of information, 
for facial recognition. And when you put a photo on Facebook, Facebook already knows who is who, automatically tags the people in the photo. It's amazing the amount of data that they have about people. And again, the problem is not artificial intelligence. The problem is the humans who are taking advantage of these technologies to take advantage of us, humans, or citizens. Let's go further. Let's assume that Kindle has a camera. My iPad has, so I'm pretty sure that when I'm reading something, my iPad is recording my face. Don't have any doubt on it. If Kindle has a camera, what implications? Well, Kindle could know if I'm frustrated with a book. Kindle can know if I'm happy with some specific topic in a book. It can know if I cried. So more data, even more data, will be stored about you. The, al the algorithm will start to know you even better. Let's try to push this Kindle example a little bit further. So the problem, so we saw information technology. They are gathering every single piece of our information to feed their companies to know who we are or what we want, to bombard us with products. I go to YouTube, YouTube knows what I like to hear. I go to Amazon, I'm not <coughs> thinking about, any, about buying something specific, but Amazon said you might be interested in this. Because people who have similar patterns as you, the fitness patterns, they chose to buy that recently, so maybe you also want to buy. This is just information technology. What happens now when they start to put our own self in these systems? Our own self means our adrenaline, our blood pressure, our heart rate. We all have an Apple Watch, right? The <laughs> okay, so with technology, um, okay, I forgot to copy paste. See, biotechnology, <laughs> not information technology, is the use of information with living organisms to try to deploy and make new products. How can we use such things? Again, what if Kindle knows the, uh, my blood pressure when I'm reading a page? It knows that I got excited. It can see my adrenaline levels. It can see my heartbeat. It can see if I'm sweating from my <coughs> hands. And again, the algorithm will know you even better than before. So in the end, you are being a mouse detested in a laboratory to predict every single action that you want, to manipulate you. Right? And we are in the age of fake news. If they want to manipulate you, they know how to manipulate you because they know what you like. They know what you want to hear. And it's interesting to see that, um, well, I always like to go back to the past because um, the same questions that we deal today are always the same that we, deal, we have dealt in the past. The problem is uh, we, if we don't see what they answered back then, well, we lose too much time here to come up and arrive at the same conclusion as them. So I always like to see how much we evolved in terms of the past. So basically what I feel nowadays is that we are shifting <coughs> our responsibility. When I say that Google Maps, Google Maps told me to go to the right, I'd say in that I don't like what I found in the right, or I say that uh, I got late because of Google Maps. I didn't do this well because of Google. I'm taking away the responsibility from me. But much easier, actually. Before, the responsibility came from the cloud. You know, God, God, what should I do? Or priest, which is the representative of God, what should I do? So you would go to the church and you ask, please, should I go to the left or should I go to the right? And the priest would say, what does the Holy Scripture say about it? <laughs> and you would go to the book and oh, it says to go to the right. And go to the right. Be in peace. <laughs> then we shifted to the 20th century. And in this case, we started to focus in ourselves. What do I feel about it? Gay marriage. If two men love each other, well, if they are not killing anyone, causing no harm, why shouldn't they marry? 
we are the source of authority, or we used to be the source of authority. So we would ask ourselves, what is my feeling about it? Even if it's true or not, what do I feel? And I follow my feeling. Nowadays, we trust what algorithms. I'm lost, Google, what should I do? And we follow what the machine is telling us. And it's quite scary because if the machine has another human behind it, which always has, that has other purposes for our path, they will can manipulate us to go to certain directions. This is exactly the, the problem that we are facing nowadays. Because we don't use our brains anymore. We don't think, why should I think? I have Google for something. I had a student back in Leicester. I was solving an exercise with her. Oh my God, pro uh, oh my God, professor, I have to think to solve this. <laughs> I hear students, you cannot imagine of the beautiful things that you can do if you use this once in a while. Not every day, but just starting once in a while. And they never get my jokes. <laughs> And uh, one interesting case is Angelina Jolie's case. So Angelina Jolie made a gene test. She was informed that she has a, muta a mutation in her BRCA1 <coughs> gene, breast cancer gene. And this breast, uh, this gene, this mutation gave her 80% chances. The machine gave a prediction of 80% chances of her developing breast cancer later in the future. She felt great, she felt well, she doesn't feel sick, <coughs> but she trusted the machine. And she did, it's not, a, it's not a medicine that you take and that's it, no, she did a really, a double mastectomy, which is a, it's difficult for a woman to do such, such operation. It's a big decision. And yet she trusted the machine, even if maybe the machine was wrong. And uh, many people started to follow her. If she did it, I want it. People went to the doctor saying, I want what Angelina Jolie did. <laughs> so this is the impact of uh, a machine, of what the machine can do in our lives. We trust more the machine. Maybe, maybe it was correct, maybe not. Well, I don't know. We don't have the power to foresee the future. The machine can try to estimate it, but it's never certain. But again, we are trusting what the machines are telling us. And that's, that's already telling us a lot about us, what us as humans are becoming. Right? In Sweden, the same thing. In Sweden, people are putting chips inside their skin to do routine tasks, to pay stuff for ID, to show ID, so they just scan the hand some device, God knows what, and they are identified. It's inside their skin, so it can measure blood pressure, it can measure heart rates, it can measure <coughs> sugar levels, which are also associated with adrenaline or so. And don't ask me how, but <coughs> the chip also stores emergency contacts, social media profiles, <laughs> and rail journeys. Uh, don't ask me how. But it's something that is already occurring, and people want to do it. It's cool. Or uh, less work to carry one more card in my wallet. I can lose the card, oh, thank God. I have to go to Portugal and Google record the, the entire trip, and I lost mine. <coughs> so it's incredible how we are shifting away our human component to machines. It's really something that we should think about. OK, this maybe it can be convenient, maybe not, but I think the question that we need to ask is, who are we in the end? Who are we? Well, what is, why are we here in the first place? Because if it's to be a, a mouse, where they just gather our data to manipulate us with products, with <coughs> news, uh, political parties, we are now hearing a lot, of, for instance, how Trump emerged, how Bolsonaro in Brazil emerged, or based on fake news, people believe in these things and they don't want to see facts because they know what people want to hear. When a politician projects it's angry to a, a population who is already angry, 
who already has this anger, that people will find a pattern that, okay, he feels the same as I do. I will vote for him. Not because of what he will do, or no, he is showing what I want to see. So again, this, uh, this topic, again, the problem is not really artificial intelligence. As you can see, artificial intelligence is something that can actually be good for us. It's helping us, medical decision making, trying to know more about our genome, try to detect uh, diseases early. But in another way, humans are taking property of these algorithms. Machines are becoming cheaper in terms of storage, cheaper in terms of processing power, and uh, they are evolving quite fast in this in these two directions. So they are storing endless amounts of information of each single person. And the true question that we have to ask is, what are they doing with that information? How can I protect myself? But we all know that this information is in collected. <coughs> I'm here speaking to you, and your iPhones is hearing what I'm saying, and maybe, maybe your Facebook will show things connected to my talk. Try it. It works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> so everything is being recorded. So the thing is, what I usually tell to my students is that the best way to protect ourselves is to understand the environment that we live in, because we cannot, well, we can run away from this by being offline, but this is not the solution, because uh, society is evolving and we need to evolve with it. But we need to understand when we are being manipulated or not. So I go to Facebook and I probably will see now an advertisement about artificial intelligence, and I will know, yeah, I get a copy of this, it's mine. <laughs> and I don't feel the urge to, to do something. So information, reading, thinking, we go back to our human nature of questioning things. We forgot to, we forgot it, uh, that ability because the ability, the machine answers everything. It's, the machine answers patterns. The machine does not uh, have a deep thinking about uh, topics as uh, war, as ethics, as moral, uh, about ourselves, what is our purpose, how can we be, how can we be more resilient in a society that keeps changing? That has to come from within. And that's why it's also important that the work, that's why I like the work that we do here in the school because I also used to be one of these robots <laughs> where you just uh, go to the computer, do everything, and they, I forget about uh, questioning the world. It's, we are basically <coughs> sleeping in this world where machines do everything for us. And, um, cannot be like this. If one day the machines fail, you're screwed, basically. <laughs> and it's not that hard, you know, that all data centers are near the sea. With climate changes, sea levels rise. One can easily destroy a data center like this. And we are nothing without data. So this was my message for today. I uh, hope you enjoy it. And thank you very much. Thank you.